laughter provides a rich source of information about complex social relationships, and learning to understand laughter is a particularly valuable skill. In fact, there is a whole branch of science preoccupied with the psychological and physiological effects of laughter on the human body called gelontology, coming from the Greek gelos meaning laughter. Gelotologists spend their time analyzing when people laugh, the sounds they make, and the effect this has on their body and mind. <laughs> oh, can you imagine listening to this all day? Spontaneous or involuntary laughter is hard to fake, providing an honest account about what people may think about social situations, each other, and just as importantly, what they might think about you. Voluntary laughter or polite social laughter is a different kind of laughter, something that people are routinely doing as part of their communicative acts. For example, there are different types of laughter that accomplish different interactional purposes. Just as clearing one's throat can be used to communicate any number of messages, from a respiratory infection to a persistent phlegm obstructing the airway, to an awkward social situation, Bodily convulsions followed by spasmodic breathing and noisy vocalizations can also satisfy several distinct communication roles, such as relief laughter, embarrassed laughter, apologetic laughter, confused laughter, polite laughter, or evil laughter. Most people find it relatively easy to distinguish between spontaneous and voluntary laughter. Let's see how well you do. Regardless of how you did in recognizing spontaneous laughter from the more poised, voluntary laughter, I'm sure that hearing that has cheered you up. Laughter is a decidedly social phenomenon. Psychologist Robert Provine, who has done a lot of work on the subject, has found that people are three times more likely to laugh if they are with somebody else than if they are on their own. According to some of his studies, you are least likely to laugh or to smile immediately before bedtime or after waking, basically in circumstances that have reduced opportunities for social interaction. So most laughter is to be found in face-to-face -face interactions, meaning that people do not necessarily laugh at jokes, but they're laughing to show others that they understand them, or that they're part of the same group, or that they agree with them, or that they might actually like them. It is the in-group feeling, the positive emotions, and the mutual playfulness, rather than witticism, that marks the context of naturally occurring laughter. In conversations, laughter is doing a lot of emotional work. Another reason why people laugh in groups is because laughter is contagious. You can literally catch laughter from somebody else. For instance, in 1962, there was an outbreak of contagious laughter in what is now known as Tanzania. It all began with a rather isolated fit of giggles in a group of schoolgirls that rapidly rose to epidemic proportions leading to more than a thousand people sick with laughter and 14 schools closed. Doctors frantically looked for the cause, and after ruling out encephalitis and toxic reactions, concluded that it must have been good old hysteria. In other parts of the world, contagious laughter afflicted groups of charismatic Christian churches, where it was concluded that the worshippers must have been filled with the Holy Spirit, who apparently had developed a sense of humor. 
Rather than dismissing contagious laughter as a behavioral curiosity, Robert Provine suggests that we should recognize it as clue to broader and deeper issues. When we hear laughter, we become beasts of the herd, mindlessly laughing in turn, producing a behavioral chain reaction that sweeps through our group, creating a crescendo of jocularity or ridicule. And the catching nature of laughter has a commercial potential too. From the laugh tracks accompanying many sitcoms since the 1950s, <laughs> to the OK Laughing Record, released in Germany in 1923, when Otto Heinemann decided that after the First World War, people were in need of some cheering up. culture, it is easy to focus too much on the positive, so good kind of laughter. But as social psychologist Michael Billig notes, we should not underestimate the dark side of laughter. Humor in the form of ridicule is used by those in power as a disciplinary means to uphold forms of conduct and conventions of meaning. The possibility of ridicule ensures that members of society routinely comply with the customs and habits of their social milieu. In conclusion, remember that laughing at is to ridicule, to target outsiders who look or act differently, trying to get them to comply to the majority's norms or drive them away. But laughing with brings happy feelings, pleasure, feelings of acceptance and in-group bonding.